your wife, Camilla, posted the most beautiful tribute when your book went to number one. What did that mean to you? I, you know, I just saw that. Someone sent that to me. I, I did not even know she'd put that out. And it was very cool to read that. One, to read the facts of what she put up there. Um, but also just reminded me of, you know, she was the first person I thanked when I found out that the book had done so well and opened up at number one because... I mean, I couldn't have done it without her. She, from the initial pushing me out the door and giving me, helping me, give me the courage to say, get out of here. You've been threatening to write a book for a while. I see it eating at you. Get out of here. Do not come back until you've got something. And then to tell me when I would be away for two weeks and feeling like, oh, I think I need to get back. She was like, we got it. We're good. If you're, if you're still in the zone writing, do not come back. Stay there. Um, so she was an incredible amount of support. And then I would share with her different drafts as I came back. And she's always been a very honest critic of, of the work I do. And she helped me out a lot. Your love story with her. I loved reading those chapters. Take me back to the moment you spotted her. She floated on air. In my eyes, she sure did. Um, if we went back and did the math, she actually was walking on the floor. But as far as I could tell, <laughs> Her head was not bobbing. She was just sliding across the, the room. Uh, yeah, I was out holding court at a table, making some margaritas, and this figure about 20 feet in front of me moved from my right to left. And there were these caramel-colored shoulders and this sort of turquoise, very thin, loose-fitting, beautiful dress on. And I remember I leaned forward without even thinking about it, and I said, what is that? <laughs> I didn't say who was that. I said, what is that? She went and sat down. I... Um, started to kind of try to get her attention to call her over from the room. And as I was doing that, I heard my mother in my ear saying, boy, get your butt up. This ain't the kind of woman you wave across the room. And I said, yes, ma'am. I got up. Uh, mind you, my mom wasn't physically there, but that's what I heard in my ear. I introduced myself to Camilla. I invited her and her friends over, which I think was a good move, because I think if I would have just invited her over and not her friends, she would have probably said no. Mm -hmm. But because I invited her and her friends over, she then came over alone. Green light. Well played. And then she sat down, and I understood Portuguese and spoke better Spanish that night than I ever have since. <laughs> and that got me in the door. And I asked her out to go out the next night. She couldn't for the most beautiful reason. It was her father's birthday. Non-negotiable. Beautiful. And uh, finally, I did get her to go out with me, and we've been going out ever since. But the night, you kind of conned her to stay over. She slept in the separate bedroom. My favorite part is you went down twice. Do you ever think about doubling her back for a third time? Third time's the charm, my friend. <sighs> no, I finally got tired. And that second, <laughs> the second time she kicked me out of that room, I could tell she more than meant it. I was like, I'm not going to test that again. <laughs> the, the, if I go back the third time, I may get injured. <laughs> I love you said there was a moment you saw her in the kitchen with your friends and it was sort of an mm. aha moment. Do you remember the moment you knew that she had to be the mother of your children and your wife? Um, it was probably about two years after that and we had been dating and it had been going really well. And um, she had come out to the set on location with me in Australia on the film Fool's Gold. And I'd never brought anyone, male or female friends with me. They none even visited. When I go to work, I'm like there in my trailer or where I'm renting my house. And I, that's all I do. I go to work, come home and, uh, and, and do it all over again. And I really like my solitude. Well, I wanted her to come out with me and uh, she did. We had taken a long weekend vacation to a little surf retreat in Papua New Guinea where we were living in like a staying in this little tree house in the middle of the jungle. It was beautiful. And about five o'clock watching the sun go down over the Solomon sea one night, like day five, I was really feeling like I would really fall in love with her. And this is the woman I want to spend the rest of my time with. And I would love for her to be the mother of children we can create. And I asked her very nervously, she was sitting to the right of me. And I said, what would I have to do to lose you? And she was so cool about it. I remember she had this, our first cocktail she had in her hand that day. And she, she had her hand, and as I asked her, what would I have to do to lose you? She just, her hand was on her way to her mouth. She didn't pause. She took a sip, swallowed it, set the glass down on the exact water ring that it had left on the, the arm of the wooden chair she was sitting in. She looked out and really composed. She goes, oh, that's easy. 
and then looked over at me and said, change. Oh, I crumpled. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> please, amen, all aboard, I'm in, let's go. And that's when I really was like, this is the one. Did she always get along with your mom, Kay? Was that instant too? No, that wasn't instant. Um, <laughs> my mom is very, very persistent about initiating any woman into any of her son's lives. Um, she did it with my two older brothers, and she had her. She 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 did it with Camilla too. She would do it by you know mispronouncing her name, calling her by different names at certain times, just to test her. And mom would, be like, and then you you call her on it, go mom, and she'd be like, oh what? Oh I didn't notice I did that. Oh yes, yeah, she did notice you did that. So she was she tested Camilla, but Camilla did the great thing that my mom was really looking for. She bucked up to her, and they had they 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 went off on a trip together one time. I think it was to Turkey, solo, just the two of them together for like a week. And boy, they got back from that trip, and my mom had full respect for Camilla and full blessing. I love that. And I was thinking, what would your dad think of Camilla? Oh, he he love her. He'd be, he, he he love he'd be um, rubbing her feet <laughs> on the couch right after right 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 after dinner each night. Oh, come here, come here, because she's got she's got beautiful feet. My dad my dad loved feet, <laughs> but he, and he he was a great masseuse <laughs> to all of us. But he would he'd be he'd have been giving her some incredible foot rubs, and he you know I miss him. He he really enjoyed a lot of the adventures we've had um, through the places my work has taken us. Um, through characters I've been able to play, through being around his grandkids, oh. you know, like my mom is now. Um, and he'd have fit right in, and we'd have had a great time with him. I love your mom and dad's passion. Married three times, divorced twice, to one another. Was it hard yeah. for you to not emulate that? I feel like you and Camilla, there's a very calmness about the two of you. Well, a hell of a lot more calm than my parents were. <laughs> My parents, their relationship, they and they preferred it this way. Yeah. They wanted uh, a storm in the Pacific daily. Um, Camilla and I would choose a choose a, a nice river with a few rapids for some excitement, but we don't need to capsize. Um, unlike my parents, um, you know, Camilla's parents were married twice, divorced three times. Oh. So if you look at our past, it'd be like, well, we have a whole lot of reasons to not be for marriage. But neither one of us really came out of our in our own personal experiences feeling that way. I mean, we saw how our parents loved each other. We respected that. Mine ended up together. Hers ended up being divorced. But we just said, you know, it made us be very, uh, we thought a lot and, and talked a lot prayed a lot and, 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 and seeked as much counsel as we could about the attributes of marriage and really were, went through why we wanted to get married and how that could continue the adventure, actually make the adventure twice as fun together rather than uh, how it would be if we had stayed just single. Um, and so we really were serious about what that meant to us. And, uh, you know, so far we're, 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 we're doing pretty good. I love all the journal entries, as Camilla said in her post to you. It is so raw and real and heartfelt. And one you wrote, and I can't remember the year, we're the same age, so you might have been, I don't think you were a teenager yet, but almost number one on your list was to become a dad eventually. Your three kids, she just posted Levi, by the way. He's your little twin. He's your mini-me. Levi, yeah, he's a, he's a beautiful young man. Um, one of the most sensitive people I've ever met. The probably most considerate person I've ever met. Um, yeah, that was, I think I wrote that down in 1992. It was a set of 10 goals in my life, and one of them was to be a father. Being a father is the only thing I ever knew I wanted to be since I was eight years old. I remember shaking hands with friends of my father's and saying, nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, sir. And the common denominator amongst all of them over the years of saying, nice to meet you, sir, to me in my eight year old mind was that they were all dads. Yeah. And so in my mind at eight years old and ever since has been, oh, that's when you've made it. That's success when you can become a father and father children through life. And I still feel that way. I love what you wrote about your daughter. You said having a daughter is a, the only honeymoon that will never end. However, Matthew, I have two teenage daughters. Do we need to talk? 
Do we need to talk? Uh, you tell me. Is that <laughs> how's that honeymoon going? You heard my phone call before we went on. I, my oldest is a freshman <laughs> in college, and uh, I, they're, they're, I have spirited young ladies, which I like. I like a little fire in them. So, what's Vita like? Oh, Vita's you know like her name, life. Uh, she is a bright light, you know, um, and she she's really got a wonderful scientific mind of figuring things out and making simplifying situations. You know, Levi and I love to create a story and, you know, for instance, where are the car keys? You know, well, maybe they're in the coat pocket that you wore in yesterday. Where's the coat? Well, maybe someone hung it up in the closet downstairs because they didn't know it was yours and didn't put it in your closet. So if we can find the coat and while he and I are going through this conspiracy theory about where the damn keys are. Vita's probably over there on the side drawing some cool picture in earshot listening to us. And all of a sudden we'll walk up and like hand us a picture. And I go, wow, that's beautiful. She was like, thanks. And then she'll go, oh, by the way, uh, you check the ignition. <laughs> and sure enough, the damn keys will be in the ignition. You know, and so she gets, she cuts two things and figures, gets to the simplest answer to things very well. Uh, my third child is the family pet. Is Livingston that way? Just pure joy. I mean, I think he drove to himself to school at age six. You know, we kind of can't find him a lot. That's that's number three. Yeah, well, you see how, you know, the third one can grow up grow up faster in ways because he's learning from his older siblings. Um, and, you know, uh, he, he very early on competed with them to make sure he got his food at the proverbial table, make sure he got his time, got to do what he wanted to do. So very early on, he he staked his claim with those two. Um, he's also he's also our house comedian. Is he? he he's, he's He's got an incredible sense of humor and has us in stitches often. <laughs> he's got a he's got a he's got a really great sense of humor. I wish we'd added four. Any chance, Matthew, can I live vicariously through you and Camilla? Um, not at present, you know, but I've said this before, um, for me to want four or more, it's a lot easier for me Yeah, <laughs> than it is for Camilla. You know, it's a lot easier for us, us, us dads than, than it is for, for, for the mamas. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'd never close the door on it, but, uh, we'll see. And so far, so good. We're happy with what we got. My other favorite thing with your book, reading all of the ups and downs, is your drive. Now, that's something I believe mm. you're born with. Do your three kids possess that drive? It's something I worry about in my own household. Right. Well, we'll see. I mean, that's still a, that's still in process. You know, I mean, we we try to show them examples of how, for instance, how my work has paid off. I'll tell you this one. It's a really good example of something that I think we all want our kids to understand is the value of delayed gratification. And I remember when I won the Oscar for Best Actor and bring the trophy home, and my kids go, what, what's the trophy for? And sometimes as a parent, you know, oh, they'll ask a question. You go, oh, this is a great time to give a teaching, teach them a lesson. And I said, well, you remember a year and a half ago when Popeye was going to work every morning, you'd wake up, I'd already be at work, I'd come home, you told me I looked like a giraffe. I was really skinny, and I'd have dinner with y'all, tuck you in, then stay up and work a couple more hours. Then you'd wake up in the morning, and I was gone again. And they go, yeah. And I said, well, what Popeye was doing every day while well, he was gone, the work he was doing then, a year and a half later, his peers gave him a trophy and said, you did excellent work. And so in their minds, they got they, they clicked on, oh, you can do something today that can reward you tomorrow. You can do things well today in your work, in your relationships that can give you, you know, green lights tomorrow. And that's a lot of what the book is, is about as well, is that sort of delayed gratification. We can engineer green lights in our future. We can be kind to our future selves with the choices we make today. It can really help. Well, choices was a big one at that time when you took um, the movie that won you the Oscars, you were being offered 14 million. What rom-com was it? Because I've loved you in all the rom-coms. What did you turn down for 14 million? I was reading, I'm like, I'm just telling. take that one I'm more time. I'm not telling, but it was a good one. <laughs> and I did say no to it. You know, that was a time in my life where I was having great success with the rom-coms. Huge. I absolutely enjoyed doing them. They paid me handsomely. It's just, I started to feel like, if I got the rom-com script tonight, oh, I could do it tomorrow morning. Yeah. 
and I wanted to find something that made me sweat in my boots, something that I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this role, but I'm going to dive in and find out. Uh, I was looking for new challenges. So those new challenges I wanted, those dramas, they weren't coming my way. And the only thing that kept coming my way when I said I'm not doing any more rom-coms was more rom-coms. And more money. And some of them came with incredible offers. That particular one was $14.5 million. Well, let me tell you, that that same script at $14.5 million was better written than that same script was at $5 million. Yeah. It, it, I, I reread that thing at fourteen five and <laughs> gave it more consideration. <laughs> it was the exact same script, exact same words, but at that number, whew, might have possibilities. Ultimately, I said no. And uh, I think that helps send a signal as well to a lot of people in Hollywood that O McConaughey is not bluffing about no more rom-coms. And then I, for the next 14 months, nothing came in. Not one offer for anything. The phone did not ring. And then after 20 months, being away, having unbranded, having not been in a theater or in your living room in any romantic comedies, having not seen me shirtless on the beach, where is McConaughey? After 20 months, I became a new good idea, I think, to different directors, financiers, producers in Hollywood, and I started to get offered the kind of roles I was looking for. What would your dad make of your success? I was sad when he passed away, but he was so proud of you with Dazed and Confused. Tell everybody, what's the advice he gave you when you said, Dad, I'm not going to law school, I'm going to become an actor? He said three of the greatest words I've ever been told at a time when I sure needed to hear them, and it's been something I've tried to, uh, a lesson I've tried to carry in my hip pocket since. He first, he says, you sure that's what you want to do? I said, yes, sir. And then he goes, well, don't half-ass it. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> um, so he not only gave me the, the, the approval to go to film school, he gave me a shot in the backside to say, go do it and do it well and, 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 and make it happen, um, which in you know, a lot of ways I feel like I've, I've, I've maintained that and made him, made him proud. Have you ever thought about leaving the business? Yeah, during that two years, that 20 months where I was getting no work, I considered other occupations. I didn't know if I'd ever get work in Hollywood again. So I considered um, being a uh, elementary teacher. I considered being a high school football coach. I considered being an uh, um, orchestral conductor, um, wildlife guide. I considered going back into law. Um, I'm glad I got offered work because I'm glad I didn't go do any of those five things because <laughs> now I can just go play one in a roll, quit that job, and go do another one. <laughs> I tell you, though, reading it, there is something I feel like, not that you're disenchanted with Hollywood, but you're the guy, you're always raising the bar. If I throw out Governor McConaughey or Senator McConaughey, mm. does any of that sound good to you? I feel like you're ready to make a big difference. Well, you know, I, I, in some ways I am excited about assuming position, position of leadership, you know, Politics is a broken business right now, and if, if, if politics finds its purpose, then I would consider that. But that would not be really up to me as, as much as it would be up to a lot of other people. Um, I'm working on a role now, and I've assumed one called the Minister of Culture, where I'm working with my university. Um, I'm working with the city of Austin to try to align values uh, across institutions, um, to align values across individuals in our city, um, to align values of businesses in Austin with the with the values of the university. Um, and I really think in this time, you know, values are, are, are bi they're bipartisan, they're non-denominational. There's, there's something, they're not rocket science. There's things we can rely on. They're the things our mama taught us that we've kind of forgotten. And there's things we can all agree on. They're yeah. fundamental principles of expectations of ourselves and each other that I think we need to redefine for each other again. And that would, I think they're the solid stepping stone that will actually help us get out of the times that we're in right now, where we have such distrust in one another, and we don't know who to believe or what to believe in. Um, and so th that's a role that I'm assuming that is not really a political role, but it is a, a, it's a role where I think I can have some, some influence and hopefully pull some things off in a good way.